Hello there, today I'm going to be talking you through Blake's poem Holy Thursday which features in Songs of Innocence but as we progress through further with his collection of poetry we'll also see that there is a paralleled poem we're in Songs of Experience as well and we'll be reflecting on Blake's intentions for that and those similarities and differences. The way that I'm going to approach this poem with you today is by giving you some context about Holy Thursday, charity schools and the significance that they had in society. Then I'm going to take you through stanza by stanza in your understanding of the poem and key ideas, imagery and words to look out for. Then finally thinking about the form and our overall reflections. So first of all then, Holy Thursday is a date within the Christian Catholic calendar, but is also known as Maundy Thursday. Now this refers to the Last Supper, the final time that Jesus was able to meet up with all the disciples. And this is when, as we can see in the, in the image here, where he was providing the, the wine and the bread representative of his body and his blood. But it was on that night that Jesus was betrayed by his disciple Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. So because of that, then it's um, it's just before the crucifixion of Christ. So therefore, it's very, very important um, in the, the Christian and Catholic uh, calendar. And you can see there on my bullet point that Maundy also refers to the word uh, Manditon which means a commandment. So if we have a look at this quotation below, and now I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So that's directly cited from the Bible. And the last comment that Jesus gave to his disciples, and notice how it's still within this mantra of love thy neighbour as thyself. There are also other ideas connected to this through the, the Ascension Day. Now what the Ascension Day refers to is um, the 40 days after Jesus's resurrection on the cross. It shows how he, it was his bodily ascension um, from Jesus going into heaven. So there's going to be these themes mapped into the poem itself through the portrayal of the children that we're going to be talking about and thinking about. So that's just kind of the background information that you need to be aware of. So Holy Thursday then also has different connotations for the purposes of this poem. And as you can see in my note there, that it is a day when poor and destitute children in charity schools sang their praises to benefactors. Now a benefactor is somebody that is giving money for a certain cause or, or charity. Remember, it's also really important to look at the images which are, I guess, to be studied in, in line with the poems. So noting how we can see the children here walking two by two, how the, the colour as well that's presented there, and how there's that sort of regimentation there. So something for you to think about. So charity schools then were set up by wealthy benefactors um, they were intended to educate poor children to become useful and God-fearing citizens. So the fear was therefore used in order to discipline them and making them more likely to do worthy and beneficial work in society. But as a result from that, because they were public funded, they were very reliant on gifts and donations from charitable organisations or individuals. And in order to control this institution, they were very regimented and structured. So they always had their own sort of regime that was going on um, in a way to be able to run these places. And because of that, uh, the charitable foundation there, the Bible was very much the centre of the education that they received. So Holy Thursday then tracks the the almost sort of ritual whereby the children are walking all the way through London um, to to pray and to listen in church and they're on their journey two by two with innocent faces clean and they're on their way to the high dome of Paul's 
they like Thames waters. Right, so they're walking through the centre of London on their way to St Paul's. Now a few things to pick up from here and, and it's why I've noted them in the image form is well first of all their innocent face is clean. Now another thing to note about the Last Supper is that Jesus was said to be washing his disciples feet to kind of show that that loyalty that he has to his disciples. Now it's interesting here that it is the the sort of the beadles, or what I mean by a beadle, um, is like a ceremonial officer trying to um, well connected with the church, but also um, ordering other institutions. How they those beadles are actually the ones cleaning the children's faces. Is there a sense of irony there? The fact that they are maybe corrupt in their means of cleaning their faces and actually getting away their their innate night well innocence and vulnerability so there's an interesting idea to pick out there they're innocent faces and they're walking two and two in red and blue and green so we've got that color imagery there um, that sense of vitality uh, which is connected with the children but the fact that they're walking two by two also reveals how these children are coerced and how they are forced to even in in their physical movements to follow the rule of their of their kind of elders but notice how that color imagery or the brightness there really contrasts with the gray-headed beetles so thinking about the connotations there um, alongside how they're presented and they're walking before with ones as white as snow. Now the ones here could actually be referring to the beatings that these children expect to have at school. So that's why I've got the, the whip in the middle. Um, and also the fact that they're white as snow could be kind of a double meaning here because it could be that there's that sense of purity and, and goodness in actually the message that these beetles are spreading. Or is it actually we're taking the darker connotation of using the whip and therefore how they are devoid of that pity, how they are devoid and not wanting to, to restore this innocence in the children. So that's an interesting idea for you to think about. Um, so they're going to the high dome of pools. Note the word high. We're going to see lots of imagery suggestive of hierarchy and, and who is actually finding their way to the top of this pyramid in terms of goodness and being closer with God and who therefore by default is at the bottom of that. Uh, they like Thames waters flow. So the idea of uh, the river Thames there once again could connect us with the sort of river imagery and the religious connotations of that but it might also reveal how it's almost like the child the children are kind of carried along with their own current of faith as well so they're kind of forced to, to follow the, the rulings um, from the Bible without actually having to question that and how they are um, com complicit in this. OK, so move on to the next stanza and I've picked out another three key images here. So there's a repetition of multitudes here. It's, it's mentioned three times in the stanza. So the fact that the masses are being taught and educated in this way um, for good or for bad is, is down to you and your interpretation but Blake here is comparing the children to flowers of London town so it's kind of once again relating to lots of the imagery that we've seen so far in this collection of poetry flowers lambs angels and how this natural goodness and an inner and outer beauty is is very visible and um, and how Blake kind of wants to hold on to that because I think by the end of this poem he's arguing that the innocence is actually can be open to exploitation and can be ruined so therefore it, it's we need to protect and value that innocence when it's there. So they're seated in companies um, they sit with radiance all on their own. So there's this sense, there's always these, these rules surrounding them. It's, um, they need to obey those rules. Uh, so therefore, they're kind of always being labelled as part of 
being in an institution really is very disciplined even in the way that they're sitting. The hum of multitudes was there but the multitudes of lambs so I think we can connect the flowers and the lambs together with that sort of the humbleness the meekness of the children um, which is always a recurring image across the songs of innocence poetry that we're seeing so far um, and I think here that the speaker is kind of admiring the children as they sit there but they're and in doing so they're, they're doing their duty but also radiating that inner goodness um, but also once again highlighting the the darkness the fact that these um, these meek and vulnerable la lambs are being sort of restricted and confined by greater social institutions. Thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. So once again, this repeated idea of hyperbole, he's referring to the fact that so many children are forced to face this lifestyle. Um, and the fact that they're raising their innocent hands, note the adjective there. So it's almost like the children are moving further down this poem to being part of this sort of like sublime, heavenly divine image and actually they're becoming closer with god so the word raising so they're, they're raising up obviously they're they're moving to a higher place which therefore connects with the fact that um you know till into the high dome so this repeated imagery of, of height and lifting so i think it's therefore trying to represent this relationship being closer with god um, and then as we move on to that final stanza, we have another three images that I've selected. Now, like a mighty wind, they raise to heaven the voice of song. So we're moving towards auditory imagery. So what I mean by that is imagery connected with sounds and things that we can hear. So we've got that very kind of simple simile to comparing their voices to a mighty wind. And then we have the harmonious thunderings as well so it's with such vigor and um well dedication and enthusiasm that they're singing therefore is going to reach the heavens so therefore they have this kind of direct contact with god here um unlike the beadles who actually are believing it's their duty to be doing this for god but actually not going about it in the most moral way so by doing so, they're going to raise to heaven um, and they're going to, these, sorry, the, the music and the sounds is going to uh, even enter the seats of heaven among. Yet beneath them sit the aged men. So we've kind of got a contrast in this poem. We've got this auditory imagery. We've got um, references to the children being on this, this pedestal. They're being associated with God. But then beneath them sit the age of man so that's very ironic isn't it because really the ones that have got the power and the ability to to kind of create that social order are actually put beneath by the speaker in this poem so the aged men wise guardians of the poor the word wise wise guardians you know is that that implicit irony there or is that actually Blake saying that, you know, not all these beetles are as bad as we make them out to be, in some of your interpretation, um, you know, or is it the fact that, you know, these aged men have kind of become reformed in listening to the children and seeing that sort of innocent and beautiful relationship that they have with God, that they have actually been admiring that and kind of, um, yeah, made better by that it therefore reminds me of uh, the little girl found and how like as parents after developing that stronger relationship with the lion and seeing that it isn't this creature of of danger and this beast to be feared of but actually one that they can work in unison with in harmony with in order for them to have their own innocence restored i'm kind of seeing some parallels with that here and then finally we have then cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door so therefore we're going to come on to the that i think that's a really important um line in the poem which i'm going to coincide with the final conclusion in a moment 
Um, so one way that I always suggest you approach poetry or, or any text actually uh, could be through the, the format of these two questions. What do you notice? What do you wonder? So the form, so the, the layout of and the format of a poem on the page. Some of the things that I've noticed um, is the fact that obviously we've got these three um, regular stanzas which each contain two rhymed couplets. So what I mean by the rhyming couplets is it goes, um, so clean and green, snow flow, so therefore it's A, A, B, B, and that continues throughout. I've also noticed that actually some of these lines are longer than other poems that we've looked at um, in this collection. And I'm also noticing that it is the ballad form because we've got that sort of um, nursery style like rhythm um, to kind of almost be reminiscent of the hymn like song and the, the music, which is obviously such an important part of this poem. But the most important thing that we need to do is once we've found these things that we notice, either to be jarring, to be unusual, to be interesting, we always have to follow up with what we wonder because Otherwise, it just means that we're stating something that we see, but unless you explain it, there's there's not much point in stating it, really. So therefore, in my wonderings then of those first two points, um, I was suggesting that the stanzas with the two rhyme, rhyming couplets uh, could suggest the train of children processing towards the cathedral. Um, but also it could refer to the flowing river as well and how they are kind of stuck on this course and therefore unable to to stop really and they're just kind of carrying along with it. So my final reflections for the poem, I think we can definitely see this implicit argumentative and satirical tone adopted by the speaker where there is that criticism. However, the criticism is going to be even more obvious in Holy Thursday in Songs of Experience. I also believe that when we come to that final line, then cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door. So I've put there as a question, well, who is the angel? You know, is the angel a force for good? Is it a hypocritical angel? Somebody, you know, trying to dress themselves up as an angel in society when actually their intentions aren't so good? Or is the angel there the children and therefore, you know, they should be encouraged um, and supported in society in order for us to gain a closer relationship with God? Um, and I also think it's a very moral message uh, to contemplate the true meaning of Christian pity and also Christian charity. This idea that charity can sometimes be quite an uncomfortable thing because obviously it's there to do good. But is it therefore to conceal some darker truths? And also, what are the intentions of that charitable act? Is it, you know, for your own sense of duty and to kind of clear your own conscience? But sometimes can that sort of Christian moral message actually be caught up and, and sort of removed from us? which we can kind of see in the poem, this idea that maybe, you know, these charity schools started out as really fantastic um, intentions, but as you can see over time, the, the power has sort of, well, been formed in a, in a dark sense and been implemented in this way. So therefore, you know, that, that initial charitable act has become something that's become perverse and actually uh, much more uh, problematic. So therefore I've added that a, is this idea that a public display of charity can actually, in doing so, conceal a darker meaning there. And as I mentioned um, earlier on, this idea that innocence can always be open to exploitation and therefore um, is Blake arguing that it needs to be protected and valued so that other kind of means of power doesn't corrupt that. Thank you very much.